diets, again, rich in meat, eggs, high in fat and alcohol, producing prostaglandin 2, enhancing inflammation, this has a very important role to play in the disease multiple sclerosis, and this is not new information. In fact, this was described by Dr. Swank back in the 1950s, in which he found a very strong association between diets rich in butter fat, for example, and high risk of MS, whereas diets rich in fish consumption had very low rates of incidence of multiple sclerosis. He compared individuals placed on his swank low-fat diet with those uh, reported from the Mayo Clinic getting uh, so-called standard medical care. And as this slide demonstrates, a profound reduction in the rate of progression of these individuals. In other words, the time it took for them to reach certain endpoints, like being unable to walk or work, was significantly protracted in those individuals who simply modified their diets by reducing their dietary fat. In fact, Dr. Swank uh, subsequently published this book, The Multiple Sclerosis Diet Book, which really provides some fundamentals in terms of how diet has such a profound influence on the course of this disease. Well, we ask ourselves then how much fat should be consumed. Uh, we know that Dr. Dean Ornish has recommended that 10% of our calories uh, should come from fat. Yet, we know that individuals, for example, living in Crete, consume about 40% fat calories, and yet they have only 1 the mortality from coronary artery disease when compared to Americans. The Inuit in Greenland uh, rarely develop coronary artery disease despite the fact that their diet is extremely high in fat and cholesterol. Well, the conclusion, therefore, must be that it's not the amount of fat that we consume, but rather the type of fat that we consume. And it's important to recognize that fats derived from animal products uh, tend to increase our levels of arachidonic acid. And in the presence of uh, cyclooxygenase, this does produce the two series prostaglandins or the pro-inflammatory prostaglandins. So again, animal flats, fats therefore increase prostaglandin two series, therefore animal fats are pro-inflammatory. We can inhibit this activity, inhibit cyclooxygenase by uh, what we see on this slide, the essential fatty acids, EPA, DHA, as well as ginger, turmeric, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and a newer class of drugs, so-called COX-2 inhibitors. It's important to recognize that elevation of prostaglandin E2 has been demonstrated in the neurodegenerative diseases, and in this study, again appearing in neurology, looking at the spinal fluid of Alzheimer's patients, showing a significant elevation of prostaglandin 2 series. Arachidonic acid, we know, is also uh, important for other reasons aside from the fact that it enhances a prostaglandin 2 series. We know that, yes, it enhances reactive oxygen species formation. And that can be seen on this curve when we look at bovine heart mitochondria and the amount of peroxide produced with increasing amounts of arachidonic acid, uh, the curve becomes very, very steep. And again, recognize that animal fats are the primary source of arachidonic acid uh, in our diets. So what we're saying then is that animal fats actually represent a mitochondrial toxin. So again, the food choices that we make have a direct effect on mitochondrial activity and free radical production. Now, this was uh, looked at in, the, in medical hypothesis. Could diet be used to reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease? I mean, this is really where the rubber meets the road. Reduction in the human body of the amount of available arachidonic acid, the precursor of inflammatory eicosanoids, by dietary methods might offer a path to prevention of Alzheimer's disease without resorting to drugs having potentially harmful side effects. I think that's a very profound statement. And it really brings us to the point where we have to examine this so-called gut-brain relationship. And so many uh, literature citations are coming our way these days recognizing this relationship. And this study published in The Lancet way back in 1995 showed that if you did MRI scans of the brain on individuals who have inflammatory bowel disease, whether it's Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, that a large number, much more than expected, of these individuals had focal white matter changes, much as we would see in patients with multiple sclerosis. Their statement, the frequency of focal white matter lesions in, uh, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease is almost as high as in patients with multiple sclerosis. And this is really quite compelling, that here are individuals on the right two curves uh, with uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative uh, colitis having large numbers of plaque in their brain, much as we would expect in patients with multiple sclerosis. A real solidifying uh, report with respect to recognizing this profound relationship between the gut and the brain. 
Uh, this study recently published uh, in August of 2000 showed that the observed prevalence of multiple sclerosis at the onset of inflammatory bowel disease was 3.7 times greater than expected. Again, calling our attention to this important relationship. So when we look at brains like uh, this MRI scan demonstrating diffuse white matter abnormalities, I think it's really critical that we begin to look not just at nervous system problems and nervous system function, but recognize this profound relationship with the gut. And this study published in uh, 2001 showed that in individuals having gluten sensitivity, in other words, anti-glidin antibodies being present, uh, these were many individuals who had headaches of undetermined uh, cause. And these individuals demonstrated resolution of their headaches when gluten-containing foods were taken out of their diets. And in addition, these patients had profound white matter changes, uh, again demonstrating on these MRI scans. Their statement, gluten sensitivity can be primarily and at times exclusively a neurological disease. So I think this really starts to pave the way for a very vigorous exploration of gluten and gluten sensitivity in neurologic disease and recognizing uh, that there is a profound relationship uh, between what's going on in the gut in terms of sensitivity and various neurological situations is going to turn out to be, I think, very important. Well, let's get back to our original flow sheet looking at how pro-inflammatory cytokines ultimately induce inflammation and apoptosis, in other words, cell death, and focus for a minute on this inducible nitric oxide synthase, the rate-limiting enzyme in the production of nitric oxide. When microglia are activated, many things happen, but for our purposes, we want to focus then on this induction of nitric oxide synthase because of the important role that nitric oxide plays in nervous system disease. Uh, simply stated, pro-inflammatory cytokines, from whatever cause, increase nitric oxide production. Now, why this is important is because we know that nitric oxide combines with superoxide anion to form, to form the very damaging, very severely damaging free radical uh, peroxy nitrite. And this has really been implicated in causing membrane damage, DNA damage, and protein damage as well. So a really a very nasty player. And uh, rate limiting in its formation is, of course, the formation of nitric oxide. 